He's also now becoming a much more outspoken advocate for deep sea nodules as the lowest impact way to get the battery metals needed, not just for electric vehicles, but for increased industrialization, for developing middle classes around the world and for a growing population. So we think nodules are absolutely going to be part of the solution. And as more and more people hear about this industry and they think, how can they be a part of it? The natural answer would be the metals company, ticker TMC, trading on the NASDAQ. Hello, welcome to the assay. Today I'm here with Craig Shesky, Chief Financial Officer at the Metals Company. So Craig, thanks for joining me today. Amy, it's my pleasure. And uh, so let's just dive right into it. So the Metals Company, um, you're developing the world's largest estimated uh, resource of metals required for the green energy transition through deep sea mining. So can you uh, maybe dive a little bit into the methodology for this uh, mining technique? Absolutely. And I'm glad you phrased it that way, too, because deep sea mining is a rather comprehensive category. And I think especially people who are you know, familiar with uh, what you do and you know, what we do would think, OK, mining on land, let's picture that underwater. And you know, a, a lot of potential challenges uh, would arise in one's mind. There are different types of deep sea mining. What we are about is the collection and ultimate processing of polymetallic nodules. And I hold a nodule here. This is a little potato sized rock taken from 4,200 meters below the surface of the Pacific Ocean, uh, sitting on top of the seafloor in what is known as the clarion Clipperton zone of the Pacific in the abyssal plain. So we are really picking up these loose rocks off of the seafloor in an area of the planet with much less life per square meter and relatively low levels of biodiversity as well, uh, because it's an area of the planet that's very deep, it's very dark. Other types of deep sea mining are not necessarily like that. There are types of deep sea mining that involve digging, blasting, drilling, um, seafloor massive sulfides, cobalt crusts. So just like on land where there is a wide spectrum of potential impacts, a wide spectrum of potential economic returns for shareholders, depending on the type of project you're going after, same thing in the deep ocean. And we are only focused on polymetallic nodules collected off the seafloor and then lifted to the surface via a riser system uh, with the drill ship provided by our partner, All Seas. So really it's a marriage of offshore oil and gas technology that's been around for a long time, going after metals needed for the energy transition, such as nickel, copper, cobalt, and manganese. All right, sounds great. And uh, maybe you can talk us through some of the infield data continue that's continuing to be collected by the metals company. So how does this data dispel speculation around the environmental impact of nodule mining? Well, I think taking a step back, the first place to look is what, what is the quantity of the data, and it's really been quite staggering. So looking at the industry as a whole, there has been over $2 billion spent on roughly 300 uh, research campaigns since the 1960s going to this area of the Pacific. So a lot of people think we don't know a lot about the deep ocean. It's quite the contrary when it comes to this specific patch. And in fact, people discovered these nodules back in the 1870s. The British HMS Challenger discovered these nodules lying on the seafloor. And then you flash forward to the 60s and the 70s, and you had companies like BP, Shell, U.S. Steel, Rio Tinto, Inco. Uh, they were all in this area of the Pacific Ocean collecting these nodules off of the seafloor. So this area we've known quite a bit about. To date, there has been, especially as of the last several years, an introduction of speculation, mainly driven by uh, NGOs, uh, Greenpeace, World Wildlife Fund, speculating what could the impacts be of collecting these nodules off the seafloor. And, you know, we want to answer those questions too. And we feel now we've invested enough money and sort of collected enough data alongside our research partners, many dozens of which are listed in our uh, presentations in our 10K. You can see that the data being collected is dispelling much of the previously held speculation. So this is a situation where, you know, it is a relatively new industry. So let's let the science do the talking. And so far that science is pointing in the right direction of this being much lower impact, not only than land-based mining for certain metals, but also much lower impact relative to the previously held speculation. I'll give you one example. One of the main impacts that's being talked about is the seafloor plume. So just like when you're driving a car on a dirt road, uh, our collector vehicle at the bottom of the seafloor and by the way, there's very little life per square meter. It's vast abyssal plains. Think of it like the Sahara Desert, but covered in these rocks that have nickel, copper, cobalt, and manganese. 
when you collect the rocks, um, there is a dust cloud that gets kicked up. And there had been speculation of what happens if that dust cloud uh, wafts higher into the water column and gets picked up into ocean currents. Because while tuna, whales, dolphins, they're not going below 1,000 meters typically, and we're talking about a resource at 4,000 meters, what would happen, let's say, if you know those organisms above were somehow impacted? Well, what we've found, and MIT has found, and the Germans and the Belgians, and now you're getting a lot of corroboration on this data, is that the plume, the dust that gets kicked up, rises, 92 to 98% of it only rises one to two meters above the seafloor and falls back down. And in fact, most of that dust, most of that sediment gets uh, settled within 24 hours after the collection process. So that means a much more limited uh, environmental footprint. And it's a great example of something where um, the previously held speculation was not just a little bit wrong, it was wildly incorrect. And in fact, the opposition group to this industry, which uh, is yet to you know, really change course on this opposition, previously said that this plume might travel for tens of thousands of square kilometers. And then after they saw our data come out, they quietly updated that on the website to say it could travel tens to hundreds of kilometers. So knocking off a few orders of magnitude in terms of the potential impact, and we still think it's going to be even much smaller than that. But there is no free lunch, right? We need a lot more metal, not just for decarbonization, but for a rising population. You know, if it's not grown, it has to be mined. Uh, that's an axiom that we can all appreciate. All of these materials have to come from somewhere, and you can't recycle what you don't yet have. So for metal markets that have to multiply in terms of annual supply for the developed world and developing world, where's it gonna come from? It can't come from stocks that are too insufficient for markets that have to multiply in size. Where should the new metals come from? We think nodules from the seafloor make a very great case. And this is why you're now seeing increased support from the United States, China, India, Japan, Norway, many credible industrial countries who are looking to the seafloor as the next area of interest for uh, critical minerals. Okay, sounds great. So maybe you can talk us through some of these global legislations that um, are arising and you know coming to work to support deep sea, deep sea mining. Yeah, definitely. So it's it's the United States, it's China, um, it's India who just extended um, to nodule exploration contracts um, within the Indian Ocean. Really, a lot of the focus is on the clearing Clipperton zone where TMC uh, controls three contract areas out of 17 exploration contracts that have been granted. So think of TMC as having very good ground in a very good neighborhood. And we've done more to define the resource. In fact, we have Canadian 43-101 standard as well as SEC SK-1300 standard resource statements. Uh, we have over 12 years of uh, the gathering of environmental data. We've spent roughly half a billion dollars already on developing this project. So TMC really is the furthest along. But now there's global interest in this space driven by the recognition that you know it would be a shame, let's say, for the Western world to trade energy independence for metal dependence. And if you look at where is the concentration of supply for metals like nickel and cobalt, it's actually even more concentrated than oil and gas markets. So to avoid that situation where we're dependent on a few global jurisdictions, whether it's Indonesia for nickel or the DRC for cobalt, we really view nodules as the antidote to that. Within the United States specifically, and this was actually the subject of a 60 minutes piece uh, just a couple of weeks ago, focused on US versus China competition for seafloor metals. And much of TMC's video was the basis uh, for that segment. Um, it focused on the fact that the United States has not ratified the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. The United States is not a member of the International Seabed Authority, the governing body that is regulating this industry first, allowing exploration, and then to allow exploitation of this resource. The US does not yet have a seat at the table. And there's a lot of political support in the US now building to ratify the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and join the ISA. In fact, there are 350 former political, uh, military, and intelligence community leaders who signed a letter writing just over a month ago that the US needs to ratify the UN Convention and take their seat at the table at the ISA to go after mine sites in the deep sea that are, quote, worth roughly $1 trillion each. So we're talking about a huge, huge order of magnitude in terms of uh, the potential metal supply. And that letter was signed by Hillary Clinton, Leon Panetta, many within the military and intelligence communities. You also may have seen there were 31 uh, Congress people uh, within the House of Representatives writing to the Department of Defense 
on behalf of you know how the U.S. is going to catch up in terms of processing and refining of seafloor nodules. Uh, in fact, there was a Responsible Use of Seafloor Resources Act that was proposed in the U.S. House of Representatives on how the U.S. can provide uh, political, diplomatic, and financial support for those who are collecting, processing, and refining nodules. The last thing to focus on is that the National Defense Authorization Act within the United States, signed by President Biden at the end of December last year, directs the Pentagon, the Department of Defense, to deliver a report on how the U.S. is going to take tangible steps to catch up in this industry. What I can tell you is that there are only a few places you can look to for somebody who's actually gone and developed this resource to a sufficient degree where if the U.S. wants to catch up quickly, they have to look, in our view, to TMC to help them do it, do that. And one of the great things about the resource far offshore, once we collect it, we really have our pick of the litter on where we can bring it for processing and refining. And if there is sufficient support from the U.S. or other countries, uh, we would be happy to help take the U.S. from total dependence on importing for nickel, manganese, and cobalt to total independence in all three. All right. Well, that sounds great. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit more about the company's Nori D project um, specifically. So where are you in terms of project advancement and uh, what's what's your timeline looking like here? Absolutely. So starting with the timeline, we expect to be in production on Nori D uh, around the end of the first quarter of 2026. So in mining terms, right around the corner. Um, we have already defined the size of the resource. We've taken much of Nori D, most of it from inferred to indicated, and then some of it from indicated to measured. And what we found is a very consistent and high grade resource. In fact, for Nori D, um, we had an initial assessment um, done in conjunction with AMC consultants in 2021, and Nori D had a net present value at the time of roughly $7 billion. Um, and certainly, we are now trying to develop Nori D in a capital light approach. Rather than building new ships ourselves, rather than building new processing or refining facilities, using existing assets to get into production at a very low capex build for our shareholders. And we can do that because this is not a resource where you have to build a port, a power plant, uh, railroads, um, local water supply. This is something where it's a function of how many ships you can get out there to collect these nodules. And you're seeing an increased interest from oil and gas companies to devote their drill ships instead of oil and gas to get a piece of this growing metal market. So that's an opportunity for us. Uh, and that's why for Nori D, um, we've taken a very capital aid approach. We already have the vessel system that's going to be collecting these nodules. And that system was proven um, with the ability to collect nodules in late 2022. That system in conjunction with our partner Halsey has lifted uh, over 3000 tons of nodules to the surface in a successful pilot test. Now, we also have a partner onshore in Japan, Pacific Metals, to process those nodules at a um, no capex build to TMC using an existing facility, a rotary kiln electric arc furnace facility. So you can use existing assets offshore, you can use existing assets onshore. So that's why the last remaining hurdle for us is getting the permit to allow commercial production. Now that we've done all of our resource definition, now that we've done all of our offshore environmental campaigns, we're now in the stage where we're gathering that data, we're formulating our environmental impact statement, we're formulating our pre-feasibility study to move past that initial assessment that was already done. Both the EIS and the PFS we anticipate being finished uh, around the middle of this year and then sometime following the July uh, 2024 session of the International Seabed Authority, we'd be in a position to launch our application to go into commercial production. That application review takes approximately one year so assuming that one year review process, that puts us in a position to be ready for commercial production in the first quarter of 2026. Right, sounds great. So um, I thought we could look now at um, recycling, which is a, a big a kind of um, development for the industry. Um, so can you talk a little bit about TMC's vision um, here, looking at kind of producing a closed loop system uh, with various partnerships? Definitely. Well, we've already looked at, um, you know, what a future processing facility could look like uh, if capital were no object to say, OK, down the road, let's talk about a facility that's going to be able to not only do the primary processing of polymetallic nodules, but also we've developed a um, flow sheet that we think would also allow for the recycling of black mass from spent electric vehicle batteries. 
So that's, I think, part of our vision of the future down the road to say, look, we need a massive injection of these new metals into the system to allow for that circular economy. You can't recycle what you don't yet have. So our first step is to inject those new metals at a lower environmental impact than the equivalent amount of metals uh, from other sources. So that's the near and medium term plan for us. In the much longer term, and we're talking decades in the future, we do anticipate that the recycling, um, uh, the recycling industry would be progressed to a state where perhaps we're able to pull back the throttle a little bit on new extractive industries. But I would categorize as something that is, you know, uh, further in the future, in order to even allow for that scenario to happen, we first need those new metals to come into the system. And that's where all of our efforts are devoted, uh, certainly in the near term. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess, you know, for the near term future, maybe you can share a little bit more about the outlook for TMC and for, I suppose, the deep sea mining industry uh, overall. The outlook is very bright. And we've now seen a growing chorus of support from some of the most populous nations in the world. I mentioned China, who's devoting a lot of assets and effort to deep sea mining. Uh, they do have to catch up to companies like TMC, not only in the technology race, but the fact that they've yet to do a lot of the environmental baseline studies required for them to move into commercial production. India is doing a lot in terms of uh, deep sea focus. But Norway announced earlier this year an intention to allow exploration and then pending environmental work, exploitation of seafloor resources within their territorial waters. Japan is also very supportive. The United States, as I mentioned, is taking many steps. Even Indonesia, which is dominating um, the nickel industry on land, Indonesia stated at the recent ISA meeting that they are intending to focus more on seafloor resources as well, potentially as an alternative feedstock, rather than having to go underneath their rainforests to get the nickel laterite to feed their smelters. What if they had an alternative source of supply in terms of polymetallic nodules? That's why they're interested as well. So occasionally you'll see in the media certain countries, uh, many of them in North, Northern Europe, um, many of them who don't necessarily have a cohesive energy policy saying that they don't want to explore seafloor resources, that's really the noise. The signal is really coming from the most populous nations of the world that are pushing ahead with this. And to that end, you may have seen in that 60 Minutes piece, there wasn't any talk about you know uh, global NGOs who are trying to oppose it. It was all about US versus China. And that's really where the focus is going to be uh, for this new industry. Importantly for TMC, we've also had a bit of a tailwind recently. In fact, um, you know, just in the market this week, our a new board member, Steve Jurgensen, was announced. And Steve was, for a long time, a board member of Tesla. Uh, he's also a current board member of SpaceX. He's a renowned Silicon Valley investor uh, with a lot of support from that community. And he's also now becoming a much more outspoken advocate for deep sea nodules as the lowest impact way to get the battery metals needed, not just for electric vehicles, but for increased industrialization, for developing middle classes around the world, and for a growing population. So we think nodules are absolutely going to be part of the solution. And as more and more people hear about this industry, and they think, how can they be a part of it? The natural answer would be the metals company, ticker TMC, trading on the NASDAQ. Sounds great. Definitely a lot to be kind of keeping our eyes out for. Um in the coming couple of years. So Craig, I wanna thank you for joining me here at the assay today. Thank you, Amy, anytime.